Okay, this is introduction, a little history, and a little bit about what manufacturing is. It's probably one of the longer presentations in the course. You got to put modern endeavors into historical context, um, and tool making is one of the first things that people did, um, and when you define the ages of history, um, you generally have been defining them by the materials that were used to make the tools. And that's even true today with the computer age um, or internet age. What's being done with that, it's no longer steel or bronze, but um, making things is always a big part of how we define um, human endeavors. In biblical times, um, things were being built, things were being manufactured. They had to have carts and houses and things. It's a very interesting um, situation, and I may post some information about it, or it may end up becoming something of a report, um, or an extra credit report, perhaps. Otzi, the Iceman, was a discovered um, in the in a glacier in the Alps and he was frozen and uh, they dug him out of the glacier and in this is about 1980 he had died in um, around 3300 BC they determined and what they found in traces in his lungs and what few possessions he had with him. It looked like he'd been robbed and left to die. Um, but he was apparently a trader. He was trading copper that was being smelted because they could find traces of the residue from the crude copper smelting in his lungs. And here he was trading um, copper at 3,300 BC across the Alps. Um, and so um, they were doing things with ceramics in, way before um, the parts of history. In the Dark Ages, apprenticeships came along. This is the um, 1400s or before the 1400s. Um, and you develop these terms that we use today, masterpiece. If an apprentice made a masterpiece, a perfect item of his field, he was then considered a master. Um, so this apprenticeship, in theory, was about moving forward and making better craftsmen. The reality was that the master, if he had a good apprentice, he would destroy his efforts at making, the, having this apprentice make a masterpiece because he didn't want the competition. He wanted to keep using this apprentice to make the things that he um, he would sell. So it was almost a form of slavery at the time. Today apprenticeships are truly ways to educate um, people in manufacturing. Just to put a rough history of this, um, you can see that copper was being smelted around 5000 BC and they didn't figure out how to write um, until about 3000 BC. Um, and so the um, you can see all the other stuff that happened in history. Things were being made when Buddha was born, when Jesus was crucified, when Muhammad was born. Um, these the Vikings had very special types of drills um, to, for their boats. And the Crusades, the big armor, um, that the armor that the people wore, that's where they invented screws. You had to 
to be able to screw to put those that those armor pieces together to protect this, the um, the knights. The world really changed in 1439 when Gutenberg developed the printing press. Um, they could make um, print books, and of course the first ones they did were religious, but after that they were pretty much how-to books. And um, how to do things um, eventually led in a couple hundred years to the Industrial Revolution. And so um, going from those cottage industries um, during the Renaissance, um, it was a cottage industry because you made, the manufacturers made things in their homes. One end of the home was where they had a bed and a kitchen, and the other end of the home is where they had their shop, where they would make things. Um, and you guy would get up in the morning, um, eat some breakfast, go make, walk to the other end of his cottage, make his gun or horseshoe or plow or whatever, um, and you know, if he woke up in the middle of the night, he'd go work. This distinction between home and work is, is relatively new, as we'll see. And that, using gun as an example, because it's a good example, a gun maker would have to make the barrel, he'd have to make the trigger, he'd have to make the gun stock, so he would be, he would know a little bit about woodworking, he'd know a little bit about metalworking, and um, they would do these things. At the time, you had a distinction between a tradesman and a craftsman. A craftsman would be the person who made those guns. The tradesman would be, um, generally would move from place to place and they might um, come into a place and work um, as a carpenter for a while. It would not be unusual for that gunsmith to have a carpenter tradesman make a bunch of stocks for him uh, because he wasn't, because that gunsmith might not be a very good carpenter. Um, and everything was unique. Um, guns is the example. Each barrel had a different diameter. Um, so they had to make a device with it that they could make the ball that was the right diameter to fit into the gun. Um, but it changed with the Industrial Revolution. A couple of things became um, hugely important. And One way to define it is that we now use machines to make other machines, um, but they could be higher quality. Um, when you had a good lathe, um, you could make reproduce the same kind of parts time and time again. And mass production came along, and interchangeability of parts, which we'll see, is huge. And because you had this bigger equipment, built a factory so that you could go and work there and people moved to the factories or to the cities with the factories and had homes that were separate. Um, and one of the things that they were building at this time were the railroads. It had a huge impact on, um, on life. People could now travel to new places in their mind instantly. It took four days to get from New York to San Francisco on a railroad, but um, or three days, but that was better than the six weeks that it took with a wagon and a horse. Um, and more importantly, you could get material brought in quickly and easily and in large quantities. That gunsmith in an area that didn't have steel had to hoped that he could get somebody to bring a cartload of steel um, in for him to make his guns, um, and it was very rare. Now he could basically order it up. It would arrive a few days later. Um, and he could make his guns and he could sell them. Gunsmith in Massachusetts could sell his guns to people in Ohio. Um, huge impact. If you 
need to do a um, report in a history class, an upper division history class, I would suggest that you do a report that parallels the impact of the railroad on the 1800s to the internet um, in the 2000s. It's very similar. Um, what, what the internet does for humanity, think of that as having its um, history in the railroads. And because you now had machines that could do things um, similarly, make parts similarly, the quality of things improved. Um, sticking with the gun example, Eli Whitney, who you know made the, invented the cotton gin, um, but he did, was, did a lot of other stuff. And one of the things that he did is he got a contract to build, to, to make a bunch of rifles for the Continental Army, um, for the U.S. Army, um, by impressing the people on the committee that were going to award the contract. Um, because what he did um, is he brought in boxes of several several different boxes and he had people from the committee pick one piece out of each box and he took those pieces and he assembled them together into a rifle that was one random barrel one random trigger one random stock one random um, trigger guard one random everything that um, the rifle had and they were interchangeable it was interchangeability of parts and this was overwhelming to the um, to this committee because it had never been done before. The other people who were bidding on this contract were people who were making um, associations of individual groups. You know, one gunsmith would make 50 guns, and another one would make 40, and another one would make 30, and they would all be different, um, but they would be able to provide the. 2,000 guns that they wanted. And I witnessed it. They're all going to be identical. A part breaks, you take it off, and you put on a new one. And so he got the contract. Um, you got to think about how we take that this kind of stuff for granted. It was huge, huge back in that time. Um, so factories have moved into the factory, and by the 1900, um, they were starting to make cars, and Henry Ford, a famous manufacturer, um, another topic would be if you're in a history class in GE and got to write a report, um, write about Henry Ford's life and morals. Um, but he built the Forge. He built the River Rouge plant and um, opened it up in 1908, and biggest factory in history. And they would bring iron ore, limestone, trees, because the Model T's had wood sides, um, rubber, raw rubber, and they had um, mills to um, refine the ore into the steel that they needed. They had um, the facilities to vulcanize the rubber for the tires. They had sawmills to cut up the pieces for the sides of the car. And it would go through the whole process and cars would come out the other end. It was fully um, contained manufacturing. And this was the layout. The part at the bottom is where the still steel mills were, where they would um, turn the ore into steel. It's where the sawmills were to take the logs and turn them into the sides of the cars and the, um, the vulcanization plants. Then the material would travel to the central building in the middle, which would be the um, assembly lines. So it would take all the parts up there and then do all the assembly. And then at the top is where the cars would be stored before they would be put on to railroad cars to be taken across the country. This was in 1908. 
here's a picture of what it looked like from that from those cars that are getting ready to be sent out and of course some of those spaces were parking lots for the employees here's what it looks like today um, in about 2000 now it's not quite the same that it was at the time and things of course have been shifted and moved around in the foreground you see um, some assembly lines that are there and at the top and towards the right are um, where the docks st still are um, what and the, the there's still some steel working going on there it's steel making but it's actually owned by US Steel um, it's not part of Ford anymore and um, I don't think they do the other works there. I, I had to, uh, one of my customers um, was in in the, this plant and I've been there and it's, it's still pretty amazing. You'll also notice um, some greenery over on the right on some buildings. Some of these buildings actually have, um, the roofs have been covered with dirt and they've planted greenery that helps keep the buildings cool in the summer and of course it's a nice green thing so it's actually considered a fairly green very environmentally conscious um, plant what unlike it was in the early um, 1900s so let's now define this word manufacturing um, you've seen the history people were making things but what does it actually mean today you can say oh you're gonna make some well, um, is that manufacturing, that construction site, that they're building an apartment building, is that, would you consider that manufacturing? Um, generally, no. You would say that's construction. That's a whole different process. Um, but you sometimes have machinery. There's to make stickers for labels for ketchup bottles and other things um, the machinery that to make those things to print those things is are huge you got to put silicon down on the backing part you got to put glue on the part that's going to have the, the label um, just like you know the peel off labels to say hello my name is um, some of those mach the machinery to put all of that stuff together and then print it um, can be 100 yards long one machine um, well and so the people that make those machines um, they only make one a year but you can would consider those machines to be manufactured not constructed so it's really tricky as to what it is um, in the 1980s there was a big push by Nixon to outlaw pornography um, Larry Flint and these people were publishing magazines and Hugh Hefner publishing magazines of naked women we've got to stop because youth is being corrupted um, and so of course case made at the Supreme Court and one of the lawyers for I guess it was Larry Flint said um, showed a picture from a hustler magazine and a picture of a um, nude sculpted by Michelangelo and they were posed the same way and said why is this pornography but the Michelangelo statue is considered fine art and Justice Stewart said um, he was the most Supreme Court justice in the excuse me Justice Potter, um, he said, I can't describe it, but I know of pornography when I see it. <laughs> well, that's kind of how it is with manufacturing. You build one machine a year and it's manufacturing. You build one house, one building a year and it's called construction. Um, you might think that it's mass production there is construction like that. So what we're going to use as a definition 
because there has to be four parts to it. You have to use tools and machines, um, and you have to follow processes, and you're applying knowledge, and you're converting raw material into new products. And you could define construction in the same way. Um, and you can find repair in pretty much the same way. But this is um, that four part definition is what we're going to call manufacturing. And you need to um, think beyond what you go to buy at Costco or Walmart as what's manufactured. There are consumer goods, cars, electronics, food. Food is manufactured. Um, what the consumer buys is at one level, but there's a whole nother group of things being manufactured behind the scenes. Um, some books will call it producer goods, some will call it industrial goods, but somebody has to make the machinery. Um, somebody has to make the drills and the drill presses and the instrumentation to measure um, you know, the thermometers to measure temperature, or the control systems to control lighting. And you have those finished producer goods, and then you have the intermediate producer goods, um, and you go from in a, in a, to do some of these things you have um, they're built on speculation and huge companies that just do little things here in Fresno um, one of the places you used to be able to go visit was called Bet Springs and they make the springs for big semi trucks 18 wheeler trucks and that's what they make. They don't make the trucks, but they make these intermediate commodities. And of course, a whole bunch of people making raw materials. Um, and so you've got these commodities used by other industries. You've got components used by one company, but built by another. Um, and a couple of terms to be in here is, is fabrication. You have fabrication companies that just assemble things and um, you also have a whole category of these producer goods or industrial goods that are continuous goods um, wire uh, rolls of material um, liquids glass it's just continuously being fabricated um, and used further up the line in a lot of different ways um, some of the systems that are within the, the processes, you've got the fabrication system where you make sub-assemblies and you um, make the, the components that are then assembled and the assembly is a whole other part. We're, it, we may try to do a little assembly, but um, we're going to be looking at fabrication, making the parts. Um, and one of the things is that it has to be organized, it has to be a process. You have to have it organized to convert this material from one form and take it to another. Now, in this information age, computer age, um, like I say, we're opening the world, and the computer has improved quality within. Um, manufacturing. We're going to be looking at how quality systems are used in manufacturing and we're going to be talking about the trends in manufacturing and computerization is important and computer controlled machines are important. Now as I said earlier the purpose of this course is to learn how things are made, how to use resources wisely. Um, it is not a course where you're going to learn to be a welder. You can learn what welding is hopefully. Um, and we're going to try to expose you to the tools and processes of manufacturing. So, um, in summary, I've talked about the evolution of manufacturing from early days to um, the industrial, through the industrial revolution and the information age of where we sit. 
we're going to be looking more at it and the, um, we're going to be defining the processes as we go forward and what the resources are for the different processes.